Okay, we will go ahead and get started. It is 12 o'clock. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our eighth online community education program this spring, a match made in evolution, the co-evolution of plants and pollinators with Caprice Disbro. Feel free to say hello in the chat box and let us know where you're tuning in from today. My name is Allison Titus. I am the community education manager here at the Laguna Foundation. In addition to Caprice, we are also joined by Christine Fontaine, our wonderful education director here at the Laguna Foundation. She'll be managing the chat, fielding questions, and adding some helpful links to resources if necessary while we go through the webinar. Hi, Christine. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. You're in for a treat today. The Laguna Foundation is a nonprofit organization based in Santa Rosa that works to restore, conserve, and inspire public appreciation for the Laguna de Santa Rosa. The Laguna is a wetland complex and a 22 mile long channel, as well as an entire watershed. There's a lot of ways to describe it. If you live in Katati, Roanert Park, Santa Rosa, or Windsor, you live within the Laguna watershed. The Laguna is designated as a wetland of international importance because it is home to an amazingly diverse array of mammals, reptiles, amphibians, insects, and of course, plants. It's an important stop for birds migrating along the Pacific Flyway and also home to rare and endangered plants and animals. It's also where a huge portion of the population of Sonoma County lives, works, and recreates. It's a great place to connect with the natural world in your backyard and beyond. So I'll start with a few housekeeping notes for a successful webinar experience. Um, you are muted and your video is off for this webinar. Christine and I will have our video on during the introduction and closing, and Christine will have her video on when she takes questions throughout the webinar. Caprice will be on throughout the entire webinar. So feel free to add your questions and please say hello in the chat box. You can hover your mouse over the bottom of your Zoom screen and the option to select the chat box should pop up. Um, you can click on the chat box icon to say hi, and you can also use the small gray drop down box to select whether you'd like to chat with all attendees and panelists or all panelists, which would just be to Caprice, myself, and Christine. So we will pause the webinar um, a couple times to take questions that are coming up in the chat as we go. And we will also follow up with an email after the webinar has concluded, answering any questions we didn't get to and sharing a recording in case there's something you missed. Our presenter today is Caprice Disbro. This is her second webinar with us this spring. The first one was just so great. We had to ask her to come back and do another one. She just finished teaching an online botany class at Santa Rosa Junior College and is finishing one up at Napa Valley College, where she is an instructor of botany. She's also a professional botanist. She holds a bachelor's degree in plant biology from UC Davis and a master's degree in biology from Sonoma State. She's passionate about the diversity and evolution of California native plants and serves on the board of the California Native Plant Society's Milo Baker chapter where she edits the newsletter, serves on the scholarship committee, and helps with education, outreach, and communications. She enjoys teaching people about biology and ecology and strives to make education accessible to all people. Since this is our last in-house webinar of the spring, Christine and I will share some fun statistics about who's been attending our webinars and how many people and some silver linings we found in all of this, in addition to our usual announcements at the end. So stay tuned for that. And thank you all so much for supporting us and joining us virtually this spring. Caprice, I'll hand it over to you to get started. Thank you, Allison, and thank you all for tuning in today. I'm excited 
to tell you about this match made in evolution. We're going to cover coevolution, including natural selection. We're going to talk about generalists and specialists when it comes to these romantic relationships between plants and pollinators. And we'll finish today with just a couple examples of when these relationships turn a little sour. So we have to start with natural selection. If we're going to talk about how a plant and a pollinator enters into this relationship, we've got to talk about the process that led us here. So it all starts with variation in traits. And in this example, we've got green beetles and brown beetles. And here's the important part. Not all of these organisms are going to survive. Not every single offspring is going to make it to the next generation. Whether it's predation by a bird, or maybe just the features of some of those offspring just are not ideal for that environment. So this is important in natural selection. We've got variation in traits, and some will have better survival, and more importantly, better reproduction than others. And because of the genetic basis of heredity, we're not getting into that, but because of heredity, the species with these traits, in this case, brown coloration, will have offspring that will likely have brown coloration, those heritable traits. And so we'll see a shift in this population, in this case, being more brown, because it's most suited to the environment. And so over many, many generations, given the selective pressure of this bird and predation, we can see a shift in traits leading to, in this case, a change of coloration. So I'm gonna go through a few examples of how this can work for coloration or maybe for some other structures and shapes. And this will all set us up for how we got to the plant pollinator coevolutionary story. This is a fun example of moths both living on oak species. One of them primarily forages on oak flowers and the other primarily uh, forages on the oak leaves near the stems. And as you can see here, over many, many generations, those moths that had some shape, color, texture, some characteristic that gave them a slight advantage, uh, maybe less likely to be predated upon, had better survival and therefore better reproduction. And so after generation after generation, we see these traits selected for. A classic example are in um, our praying mantises. These are masters of mimicry. Again, generation after generation of selecting for traits that help them blend into their environment. So this is mimicry, but that's not the only path that natural selection can lead to. Uh, a classic example are Darwin's finches. And this, is, this led to niche partitioning. This might be a new phrase for you, niche partitioning, but let me explain. Darwin arrived at the Galapagos Islands and noticed birds that were closely related yet very different in size and beak structure. And he deduced that there must have been an ancestral finch that arrived at the Galapagos. And when it arrived, this bird was competing probably fiercely for the same food source. And competition for a food source means not everyone will survive, differential survival. Uh, not everyone is going to get all of the food that they need. But if any of these finches start seeking a different food source, then they might have better survival and therefore better reproduction. And so instead of going for maybe insects, there were some ancestral finches that started going after seeds. And any traits that these birds had that made finding and eating seeds easier 
gave those offspring a better chance at survival, they were more likely to reproduce, and their offspring had some variation that also had some slight shifts in their traits that gave them an advantage. And so you can see, I hope you can see, that over time, these selective pressures can lead to these unique traits and advantages generation after generation after generation. So this is the process of natural selection. Another example to set us up for coevolution between plants and pollinators is the classic example of artificial selection with brassicas. Did you know that kale, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, broccoli, kohlrabi, cauliflower are all the same species? They're the same species, but what we've done is instead of nature acting as a selective pressure, humans have decided what trait will lead to the better survival and reproduction. So in this case, we find the wild musters that have the biggest leaves and cross them with each other. And then of those seeds produced, we select those that have the largest leaves and cross those with each other. And generation after generation, we form kale. The seeds of this kale plant will make another plant that has large leaves but yet it's still the same species as these other variations of the same species. We've got, uh, we've got our apical bud. These are our auxiliary buds, the buds along the side of the plant. Here, humans have selected for flowers, kohlrabi. We've selected wild mustards that have a big, thick, short stem. So this all sets us up for how we could have come to the point where a flower and a pollinator work together so lovingly. But before they, they even met, before these two even began their love affair, the flower didn't even realize that it needed this kind of a partner. Because early on, plants used passive pollination. The gymnosperms, the pines, and the conifers, the group that evolved right before flowering plants, uses passive pollination. Think about those pine trees with all of that pollen. The earliest flowering plants did something similar. This is a game of numbers and chance. For this strategy to work, you've got to produce a lot of pollen and you're trusting, you're hoping to anthropomorphize that this pollen will make it where it needs to go. It's limited in distance and uh, it's not very efficient, but it works, the strategy works. And in fact, grasses are flowering plants that still choose to be passive pollinators. Early flowering plants, that are just in the beginning process of this selective pressure, this natural selective process, um, weren't very specialized yet. Flowers uh, were quite simple, all the structures were quite vulnerable, and uh, some of these were using wind or water for pollination and dispersal of seeds early on. But nevertheless, there must have been some advantage to producing such a showy shape because insects did land on these. And those that had insects that landed on these flowers, ate some pollen, collected some pollen, and then landed on another, had an efficient form of pollen transfer. And so as you can imagine, that was a positive selective pressure those that had that pollen transfer had better survival and more importantly, better reproduction. This, led, this is called active pollination. And this can be a very efficient and accurate form 
of pollination. It leads to better pollination success and you don't have to produce nearly as much pollen. But these early flowers were quite vulnerable to damage. In the beginning, their ovules, which is what becomes the seed, were exposed and could be munched on or crushed or damaged. And so we start to see over a great amount of time derived features in flowers where these ovules are enclosed in a structure called a carpal, uh, which is a structure that will become part of the fruit eventually. And we'll see inferior ovaries. This means the location of the, what will become the seeds, the ovules, is tucked down farther, kind of below where the petals are attached. So in more derived flowers, over a great amount of time, we see these shifts that lead to the safety of the reproductive parts and um, successful pollination. So in this part, in this stage in the relationship, they're make, these, these organisms are making sure it's safe to engage in this relationship. Now, in this flower, we've got a floral tube there's probably some nectar. Um, and I can tell that a bird might want to visit this flower. And I'll tell you later about how I know, what cued me into the fact that there might be a nectary and a flower, or a, a bird visiting this flower. Uh, but the act of getting nectar is pretty gentle and won't damage the seeds, the baby seeds down here. And in the process, this pollinator will get dusted with pollen and when they visit the next flower like this, that pollen will land right on to the receiving structure, the stigma of the next flower. So let's take a step back and think about how we could go from that early flowering plant to these extravagant and very specific shapes and structures. Let's think about that natural selective process between a plant and a pollinator. And when I think about this romantic relationship, this is where we get a little give and take, a little uh, tug back and forth, maybe a little bit of strife in the relationship. We've got a flower that wants to deliver pollen to a pollinator. It has maybe a, an expensive incentive down at the base of the flower. This will select for insects that have longer mouth parts. Those that have longer mouth parts will have better, um, better survival and better reproduction. And so we'll see more insects with long mouth parts. But flowers that have a longer floral tube will have more successful, more efficient pollen transfer because that pollen will more effectively land on this insect that really has to nuzzle in deep into this flower and get dusted with a lot of pollen. With a longer floral tube, not only does this insect get much more pollen on it, but it also might not take all of that expensive nectar thereby meaning this flower can, can provide that incentive, stretch it out among a few other pollinators. And so as that pollen tube increases, that will select for insects that have a longer mouth part. Those that have a longer mouth part get to get as much of that nectar as possible. In response, any flowers in the next generation or so that have a longer floral tube that get to dust that pollinator with more pollen and save a little bit of that nectar will have better successful reproduction. And so we get this co-evolutionary escalation where we get these extravagant traits through this process of co-evolution and natural selection where the flower evolves and the pollinator responds. So this is kind of connecting the dot between some of these incredible specialized relationships and the process of natural selection here.
you'll see that we will find similar um, specializations um, between insects and pollinators where the flower is dusting an insect in a very specific place, maybe on the top of the head, part of the body, um, that when it comes to the next flower like it, it will very efficiently put that pollen right where it needs to be. So this is a selfish process. These relationships uh, rely on a little bit of selfishness. The goal is to obtain the greatest amount of pollen transfer for the minimum amount of reward to the pollinator. This, this particular specialization is relatively rare. It's, it's pretty rare for this, this extreme um, specialization. But nevertheless, the plant is being a little manipulative, if you ask me. I think Darwin said it best. Thus, I can understand how a flower and a bee might slowly become, either simultaneously or one after the other, modified and adapted in the most perfect manner to each other by the continued preservation of individuals presenting mutual and slightly favorable deviations in structure. So here we have the process of natural selection leading to form and function, organisms, these pollinators and plants, fitting almost lock and key. And thus we have this match made in evolution. Do we have any questions at this point about natural selection? No, Caprice, you must be explaining everything really, really well. There are no questions in the chat yet. <laughs> Happy to hear that. Feel free to reach out anytime. Okay. Okay. So through this process of natural selection and this mutual benefit of a pollinator receiving a food source, either nectar or pollen, and the flower uh, transferring its pollen really efficiently, we get kind of two big categories of pollinators. The first are the generalist pollinators and the second are the specialist pollinators. We'll start by talking about the generalists, but I want to, I want to tell you that it's really a spectrum. For any flower you're considering, think about a flower in your garden. You might not have one of those extreme specialists, and it might also not be um, entirely a generalist type flower. It might lie somewhere in between along a spectrum from a generalist, flower shape and structure to a very specialized um, flower shape and structure. But I'll talk about these generally. I like to think of these generalized pollinator relationships as open relationships. In this example, this is a, a little flower um, from Florida, the Spanish needle, that is known for being a good generalist flower all sorts of pollinators are happy to land on this flower. What kind of things do you notice about the flower? Shape, structure, color. In my little blurb on the side, I mentioned that there's copious amounts of nectar and pollen. That's part of the story. What you may have noticed, what you might have noticed is a broad and open flower that's accessible to a lot of different pollinators. If the flower you're thinking of in your garden fits that bill, you might be looking at a plant that is using the strategy. Flat, open, coloration might be white, off-white, yellow, greenish, um, these generalist flowers often have some kind of scent, some degree. They're often really strong, robust, and solitary. We'll have kind of one open flower that uh, is accessible to all kinds of pollinators. And these pollinators for this strategy are pretty unreliable. We get 
migrating species, we get episodic, so those that have maybe a short period, um, short lifespan, uh, very seasonal, maybe only every few years or maybe just for a week, couple weeks in spring. So some of these situations where um, these flowers are able to provide an incentive for pollinators, all kinds of pollinators, um, and these uh, numbers and frequency of visits might fluctuate all throughout the year. There are some big advantages, but there are also some disadvantages to the strategy. Many flowers fit the bill of a generalist, and that's because you don't have to worry about um, any issues with timing or numbers when you're trusting that any pollinator, just about anyone could come by and help you spread your pollen. We're not worrying about um, big decreases in numbers uh, because some other pollinator will come by and help move that pollen. So this ensures pollination and it's especially valuable in dynamic and changing environments. So this could be um, part of the country that has big changes in um, seasonality, parts of the world that have a lot of seasonality. Um, this can also pertain to areas that are particularly affected by climate change. This strategy will be beneficial if any one of those pollinators is no longer able to visit an area or its range shifts in, in location or timing. Um, these plants, these relationships will, will withstand the test of time. The disadvantage though is your pollination efficiency is decreased. It's not always guaranteed that that pollinator who maybe lands on the sunflower is gonna go to a sunflower next. It might go to a different flower and in the process lose quite a bit of that pollen that's sticking to the hairs or structures on the pollinator. And so to mitigate this, these flowers make a lot of pollen and maybe a lot of nectar to entice these insects and birds and animals to come to the flower, but the efficiency just isn't that great. So a little bit of energy is lost here. Nevertheless, this is a great strategy. But an improvement on that, or maybe, maybe not an improvement, but just another strategy is to be a specialist. Specialized pollinators, instead of having an open relationship, they're a little more picky. They um, find that partner and stick with it a bit more. Again, this is a spectrum. Uh, there might be a category or group, a type of flowers, a subset, um, but they're more particular. And some of these, these characteristics um, involve flower shape and insect shape or in pollinator shape, color, scent, nectaries, whether they're present or not, and if they are present, where are they located? Uh, and then also mechanisms for transferring pollen. So we'll look at some of these specializations for a handful of different types of pollinators. Some that I will not be talking about today are wasps, beetles, or flies. But we will talk about bees, butterflies and moths, birds and bats. So think about some of the flowers in your garden. And have you noticed any bees pollinating them? You probably have. Bees are responsible for pollinating more types of plants than any other animal. So these are absolutely part of the generalist strategy. But we do have a, quite a few plants that employ very specific specializations to get bees to do the work for them. Um, this work of pollinating is critical to bees because they live on nectar. And pollen is also collected for the reproductive process for when these bees are um, 
laying their larva into a pollen nectar mass. Bees can um, recognize color and scent. Um, they like outlines um, and kind of guides that lead them into a flower. And what's really striking and what's shown here in this picture is that bees can see in the infrared spectrum as well. So this yellow flower is one that humans can see. But if you look at it with an, uh, an ultra uh, violet light shining on it, so we can see in the infrared spectrum, uh, you'll see this uh, target that the bee can use to really zero in on the place they want to go when landing on this flower. Uh, you'll often see blues, you'll see whites, yellows are common for bees as well. And as I mentioned, these kind of guides or lines or these kind of um, targets that we may see or maybe we won't see on flowers. These are common for bees. The European honeybee is very common here in California and in this region, but a few of our native bee pollinators are solitary bees, shown here, and our bumblebees, shown here on the right side. So in these photos, we're seeing flowers that meet the bill for the generalist strategy, but also some that exhibit some specialist uh, strategies for bees in particular. So next time you're observing a pollinator, a bee pollinator on your flower, I want you to wonder, I want you to ask yourself, am I looking at a European honey, humming honeybee? Am I looking at a little native bee? They'll be smaller, no stinger, um, ind they're independent and solitary. Or am I looking at a bumblebee, often larger and fuzzier? And notice how they're interacting with that flower. The next group we're going to look at are butterflies and moths. Uh, during the day, there are both um, butterflies and moths that are out during the day. And these are slightly larger, not always, but slightly larger insect pollinators. And so they often need some kind of landing pad or some kind of um, sturdy structure that they can hold on to or land on. Uh, we'll see large petals or we'll see kind of large uh, structures um, attached to the flower, maybe a, a thicker stamen. This is the part that holds the pollen. We'll see nectar guides. Nectar is common in um, butterfly pollinated flowers. And we'll often see bright colors. Reds, purples, pinks and oranges as well. Moths, especially nocturnal moths, these are some of those extreme cases of, of specialization. So think about these nocturnal moths. Why might they be pale colored flowers? If they're only out in the evening at night, then it's a waste of energy for the plant to make pigments. So for a nocturnal pollinator, they're often going to be uh, pollinating flowers that aren't going to waste their time making any color, any pigment. And so instead they'll produce a scent or an odor to help the pollinator find that flower. We'll see flowers that are often open at night rather than day. So if you in your garden want white flowers, you might need to consider that they'll be open early in the morning or late at night and not necessarily in the, in the middle of the day. And that's because that's when the pollinators are coming around. The flower might close itself up to protect those reproductive parts during part of the day when the pollinator isn't present. And for some of these moth pollinated flowers, you'll see these long, slender, 
corolla tubes. A corolla is all of the petals um, uh, at once, kind of talking about all the petals at once is the corolla. But we might also see a structure like we see here. This is a spur. It's kind of like a dead end of a corolla tube that has a nectary at the end. And we've got our, our pollen and our stigma uh, right here in the front of the flower. And so as we talked about earlier, when this moth comes in for that uh, nectary, that, that very expensive, high in carbohydrate food source, uh, their face will likely get dusting of pollen. And when they go into the next flower, it'll perfectly deliver that pollen. So moths are a fun group because we see those extreme specializations. Here are some photos of some other kind of um, butterflies and moths out during the day on these uh, flowers that have a strong, robust structure, something for them to land on, for them to hold on to. And we'll see butterflies and moths, butterflies more likely, on some plants that are a little bit more generalist and some that are a little bit more specialized for them. Birds. Birds are a different story. Birds are a larger organism that depend on nectar, especially hummingbirds. Nectar is, as I mentioned, a very high in carbohydrate, a very energetic, expensive for the plant food source. And birds need a lot of it. And so rather than making odor, which birds don't smell very well, so rather than making odor, these flowers are going to have big nectaries. They're going to produce nectar. Uh, and so we'll often see uh, unscented but colorful flowers with nectar. Red is a very prominent color for birds, but you might also see purples, oranges, and whites as well. In this image here, we've got this little dip in the base of the petal, and you can see kind of a glossy substance here. This is a nectary. It's a gland, a gland on the petal that slowly produces bits of nectar, a little, little bit of this sugary fluid, and a bird or other insects will reach in to lick up and eat some of this nectar. And in doing so, they'll get dusted by this articulating anther. This is where the pollen comes from. Um, we'll see that these flowers are open during the day since birds are typically out during the day. Um, and we'll see a slightly larger shape or uh, cylindrical uh, corolla for uh, hummingbirds that have a pretty thin uh, beak to reach into. Perhaps my most favorite are bats. I find bats to be so adorable. In this case, we've got a relatively larger organism. Um, but instead of nectar, these plants are, uh, or these organisms are uh, eating both pollen and nectar in these large flowers. So these are nocturnal again, so we have no need to make pigment, but we are going to make scent. These flowers are going to produce uh, either a fruity smell or a fermenting smell and because bats use echolocation, it behooves this flower, or I should say over um, generation after generation, flowers that had a more large funnel-like shape uh, had better survival and reproduction because that worked well for echolocation. So we get these uh, funnel-shaped flowers and these bats that um, put their whole face and head into the flower to get to that incentive and in doing so uh, dusting their whole face and when they go to the next flower they will effectively and efficiently move that pollen onto the stigmatic surface of the next flower. So these examples that I've shown you so far are 
really heavily um, based on floral shape and color in some cases. But which is more important for a pollinator? We see, you can see lots of cases where the pollinator and flower fit like lock and key. But here's an interesting example in Mimulus. Mimulus lewisii, this pink one up here, is primarily pollinated by bumblebees. And Mimulus cardinalis is particularly, is more likely to be um, pollinated by hummingbirds. These flowers uh, are pretty similar in shape, and they're even found in the same general area, but they aren't known to hybridize very much. So these don't often um, make offspring using the pollen from each other. They stick to their own because of this, these different um, pollinators. But researchers wondered um, if their shape is so similar, this must have to do with the color. And so they crossed Mimulus lewisii with Cardinalis to make sure that this plant has that red gene. And when they did this, they found that this flower now um, found a 68-fold increase in pollination by hummingbirds. So the hummingbirds were much more attracted to this red color or even this orangish color rather than this pink color. And when they crossed these two, but this time making sure Cardinalis had more of that pink gene, they saw a 74 fold increase in pollination by bumblebees. So this is a really neat case of color versus shape. You can see these flowers have very similar shape, similar guiding, um, similar form and function, but the color played a huge role in which insect or bird uh, was the pollinator that entered into this romantic relationship. So I think this is really interesting as you're gardening and you're maybe selecting different varieties of colors of a native plant, I encourage you to see if you're seeing different pollinators, even if it's the same uh, genus, even if they're all mimulus or all salvia, do you see different pollinators going to your blues and purple salvias versus your pink um, or red salvias? Okay, so take a look at that in the future. Another really great example where shape or color are not as much at play is this very picky um, partridge pea. This is another Florida plant that doesn't make any nectar, but this bumblebee has learned that its vibrations create a buzzing at a very specific frequency that release pollen from its anthers. So part of the story here is a little bit of color, a little bit of neck, maybe a guide right there, but the bigger picture here in this specialization is this frequency, this mechanical release of pollen that allows this bee to learn that this is an effective source, a uh, reliable source of pollen and uh, for it to go to the next flower to the next flower. Um, this is a really fun relationship here. There's some advantages and disadvantages to specializations, right? The advantage is incredibly efficient pollination especially as we go down the spectrum to very specialized. We get pollinators, their shape, their structure, the behavior that moves that pollen right to where it needs to go. And the flowers are often optimizing that uh, pollen transfer uh, uh, for the minimum reward delivered. But there's some huge disadvantages, especially as climate change seems to be increasing. These plants and insects or and pollinators are vulnerable to changes in numbers or timing. 
So if either one is off, both parties could suffer. So if a flower phenology, if it's timing when the flower opens, no longer matches up with the timing of this insect, the, the life uh, duration uh, or arrival of one of these pollinators, then this flower might miss out on this very efficient pollination transfer and have a great decrease in uh, reproduction. Likewise, if the insect misses that window, the insect or pollinator, I should say, loses a food source. So when we see shifts in phenology, the timing of the life of an organism, or shifts in range, the location of where these organisms are, uh, are surviving, their suitable habitat, if it's shifting up in elevation or up in latitude, um, these plants could be more vulnerable, these pollinators could be more vulnerable. So there's a little give and take here. Before uh, we ask a, a quick round of questions, uh, I want you to notice something about these three pictures. We've got bees, which you now know can be generalists, but also specialists. And we've got a couple different kinds of flowers that might range across that spectrum. But do you notice anything particular about these three insects? I didn't go over the structure on these bees that holds pollen. But some bees have this little pocket where they store pollen and nectar and some other things. And I wanted to bring up one last little twist to the story of specialists. And that is, even if you make a generalist flower, or even if you're primarily a generalist type of pollinator, we do have cases where an insect or a pollinator will um, consistently go to the same species of flower even though they don't have to. So here we're seeing that this pollen sac is really carrying the same kind of pollen, uh, this whitish light color from these prunas, probably from these um, cherry blossoms. Um, this pollen sac is carrying quite a bit of this bright orange. What we're seeing here is just another twist to the story. These are generalist insects in some cases, these are generalist flowers in some cases, but we'll find insects that will stick to the same species for a period of time in, in, the, in its season. Um, and we can see that when we see these consistent collections of pollen and nectar. Okay, do we have any questions on uh, generalists and specialists? There are lots of questions, Patrice. Okay. <laughs> take, a, take a big drink of water. <laughs> Um, the first one is kind of a general question. Can you um, give a time scale for coevolution? Oh gosh, uh, millions of years. Millions. Okay. And it's it's um, it's different for for most of these relationships. But the more derived the flower, the more time that has passed, and that is another story. So by more derived. I mean, um, less likely to have radial symmetry, more likely to have bilateral symmetry. By derived, I mean very much an inferior ovary rather than a superior ovary, so where the seeds and fruit will develop. Um, and so we still see a range of flowers and relationships between pollinators and plants um, from some of the earlier derived flowers to some of the uh, later derived flowers. So yes, m millions of years, okay. billions of years. Wow. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, uh, someone else asked, what do you mean by expensive nectar? Ah, so for a plant to produce nectar, it's incredibly expensive to the plant. This evolutionary trait uh, 
requires a lot of photosynthates, the sugars made by photosynthesis, um, to go to this sugary water rather than to go to building a new leaf or supporting um, new roots. And so for a plant to utilize this strategy, it was energetically favorable in that it brought a pollinator to the flower. But if not enough pollinators are arriving at that flower, then that, that nectar produced could be a very stressful or a very expensive loss to that plant. It could lead to fewer flowers being produced, shorter stature, less um, bright pigment. And so these plants have evolved strategies to try to balance these needs, um, but it's very expensive for the plant. And so we find some species that um, if you don't need to make nectar, they won't because it's very expensive. Expensive to the plant. Okay, thank you. Um, and another one, I, I hope I'm interpreting this correctly. So plants that are um, passive, have passive pollination, like grasses, um, are they capable of, this is a multi-part question, are they capable of pollinating themselves? Ah, you know, uh, I don't know. I'm going to say that this varies species to species. Um, most plants that, there are a range of strategies, you're right, that I haven't gotten into for selfing or not selfing. Selfing is when a, plant's, a plant can receive its own pollen from the, its own individual. So one flower creates the pollen and the stigma. If its own pollen lands on that stigma, um, some plants will allow that to happen, allow a pollen tube to, to grow, and allow that sperm to meet the egg to make the new generation, to make that new seed. Um, but that's a great question for grasses. I'm um, going to guess that there must be some cases because this method of pollination isn't always very efficient. But when you think about grasses, we've got um, a tall inflorescence um, in these maybe grassland environments. So they're well adapted to a breeze coming through and moving that pollen to the next grass plant. We've got high density um, growth habits in these environments. And so these end up being a very effective strategy for pollination. They're not wasting any time or energy on, on petals or sepals. They're not making any pigments. Uh, and so they're really saving time and energy and money. By money, I mean ATP and sugars from photosynthate um, by making simple flowers, depending on wind. But to get to your question, uh, I'm going to guess, yes, there are some that self because that is a way to, to avoid the chance of not getting pollinated. Okay, so the second part to this question is, does that passive pollination system sort of slow down natural selection evolution? Is, is natural selection slower then? I, I don't think it's slower. It's just a different selective pressure. So in this case, the selective pressure is to uh, grow tall. A pressure is to make a lot of pollen. The pressure could be to make pollen grains that have um, a little uh, sporopollen and jacket that catches the wind just a little better than the other. And so any plant producing this pollen um, that has any feature that is more advantageous than, uh, than the other pollen grain, than the other individual, will have better reproduction and will lead to those genes um, propagating in the landscape or being more prevalent in that region. So I wouldn't say it's necessarily faster or slower, but that would make a great research project. Um, but you'd have to use the uh, fossil record, 
pollen in the fossil record to really kind of track that. But that's a great question. And I think I'll look into that more. And um, I'd love to get back to whoever asked that question um, by doing a quick literature review on that. Okay. Um, there are many more questions, but I'm checking the time. So let me just ask you real quickly. Will you identify the bird and the flower that you used in the slide that had the Darwin quote? Oh, yes. Um, I don't have that in front of me, um, but I do have both the species of the bird and the flower in my notes. So okay. I will happily get back to you on that. Okay, so we'll include that in our follow-up email then. Okay. Okay. Um, there are many more questions, Caprice, but I think we probably should keep going with your presentation. Okay. Thank you. Well, I just have two more uh, slides. Thank oh. you guys for hanging in there. Um, these flowers, what do you notice here? These insects, these insect pollinators and these flowers, they are bypassing the reproductive parts of the flower where the pollen and the stigma are located. They're burrowing into the petals or to the corolla, and they're stealing um, the uh, nectar and maybe a little bit of pollen if it's down there um, without actually getting dusted with pollen. Uh, you might be enraged that there are these cheating lovers, these cheating relationships, but don't be too angry. Research has shown that we will still have pollinators visit these flowers that will get dusted with pollen, that will transfer that pollen. And even though they're stealing that really expensive nectar, um, these plants still reproduce at a rate that they seem to have previously. So of course, there could be a lot more research done here to, to show this, but keep an eye out in your garden for little holes in your corolla tubes, in your petals. Uh, you might have some uh, carpenter bees or some of these other nectar robbers that have outsmarted these relationships. And then lastly, we've got deception. This is often in orchids where we've got floral parts that are mimicking food and more sadly, partners will have structures that look like the female version and these insects will be attracted to these pheromones that smell exactly like uh, the pheromones of the female part of the insect or they resemble morphologically the female really well. And these insects come in thinking they're going, they found a mate, which is a lot of work to find a mate. Uh, they go in for that romantic session only to find that they are um, not finding that mate. And so this is a really fun part of the story. Uh, we could have a whole talk on orchids and deception, sexual deception in orchids. So keep an eye out if you've got some orchids, if you're an orchid lover, um, you might have some that exhibit this. Uh, not all do, but some do. So, man, plants are the best biochemists making these pheromones. They are uh, architects of shape and color and structure and mechanism, and they are master manipulators. I would argue it's the plants calling the shots here, manipulating the pollinators, and even manipulating you and me into this alluring, shape, structure, form, and function. These are the master manipulators that we know and love. And I think this is such a fun story. So thank you for tuning in. Um, I don't think we have time for more questions, but what, what do you think, Christine? Um, there's a lot of enthusiasm about bats. So let me, if you know the answer to this question or have any insight, um, someone asked, what plants can I install in my yard to encourage bats? Yes. Yuccas are a common species uh, that produce that white flower, big funnel shape. Um, a lot of succulents create um, bat um, attracted, bat um, pollinated flowers. So you'll look for a flower that has a, a relatively big shape. It's pale, whitish in color, um, and often is scented. 
so that is what I would look for. And I personally recommend that you look for a California native. Um, that way you might attract a native bat if there are any in your region. Okay, thank you. Allison? Thank you so much, Caprice, for sharing your expertise and your passion and diving into this truly fascinating topic. It really feels to me like being let in on a big secret in nature. Um, and thank you all for attending today and supporting our online programs. Don't worry, as we said, we will send the answers to some of the questions we didn't get to in the chat in an email to you coming soon. Thank you to those of you who donated upon registering for this program. We really appreciate it. If you have the means at this time to donate to support our critical conservation, restoration, and education work in the Laguna watershed, we would appreciate it. As, as director of the Laguna Foundation Education Department, I want you to know that your participation in our webinars has really sparked and fueled our creativity over these last few weeks. So thank you for your interest in our programs and for joining us um, in these last webinars that we've had over the last couple of months. Back in March, it was really difficult for us to imagine adapting our in-person, nature-based, school-based, community-based experiences into the virtual realm. But we're pleased that they've been, there have been many surprises and silver linings to taking our programs online. Um, the programs have become available to significantly more people, um, as evidenced by <laughs> the wide-ranging locations that people are tuning in from. Um, we can reach and accommodate larger audiences. You know, Heron Hall seats about 100 people, but our webinars have had much more participation than we could host in person. Um, we've exponentially increased the Laguna and the Laguna Foundation's visibility with these webinars as well. Um, most of all, though, these creative pivots that we've made going to webinars and our soon-to-be-released Laguna Explorers at Home for Kids, these creative pivots and adaptations have allowed us to stay connected with all of you, our dedicated and enthusiastic Laguna community, while we're still doing our, our part to flatten the curve. So again, thank you for your participation. It, again, has sparked us and kept us going in these times. Yeah, just to give you an idea or some numbers, um, our scheduled in-person programming for community education this spring included five in-person presentations, one of which was going to be Caprice's uh, presentation on botany for beginners, an open house, an eco-friendly garden tour, and nine in-person workshops and outings. Many of our instructors who were scheduled to give talks or lead workshops, including Caprice, were incredibly flexible and gracious and adapted their programs for an online format. Without their support, this would not have been possible either. So thank you for that. These programs, the regularly scheduled community education programs, would have reached somewhere around 250 people, more or less, depending on how registration went. As of today, webinars had a grand total of 1,165 participants register for the programs and about 490 engaged attendees. So that's unique engaged attendees in the webinars. The majority of the participants were from Sonoma County and the Greater Bay Area, but as we've seen today, there were also international attendees from France and Canada and attendees from across the United States. Folks from Alaska, New Jersey, Ohio, Virginia, Michigan, and more are just some of the places where we had viewers. The virtual eco-friendly garden tour page had over a thousand visitors on May 2nd as well. We featured 10 different guest speakers throughout this run of programs, including members of the Laguna staff and advisory committee. I really can't overstate my gratitude to you, though, our audience, for staying engaged and continuing to support our work. 
while this is not the program I envision and spent so much time and hard work crafting for the spring, it is still, as Christine said, a wonderful way to stay involved and share joyful and critical information on our Laguna watershed with the public. It's likely that we will return to this same format for many of our programs in the late summer and fall. We will be switching our attention in the near future to creating and running a virtual program for children and planning how to safely reinstate in-person programs in the field when that is possible. I am committed now more than ever to continue to use the tools available to us to make information about nature and meaningful, meaningful experiences in the natural world accessible to as many people as possible. So stay tuned and watch our e-news for more announcements about how this program develops in the future. Thank you all so much and take good care. We look forward to seeing you at a program in the future. Bye everybody.